All right, from across the pond, it's getting, food from across the pond is getting a Texas twist, and we'll take you inside a new pub that combines the taste of Texas with flavors from England. And of course, a ton of drinks. Got On tap, are you? Yeah. <laughs> Plus, a local spring break camp that's teaching kids the skills they need to rope into a career as a pro rodeo athlete. And it's a history lesson, essay lifestyle with food. I mean, that's the best kind of learning that you can get. And it's coming your way with a 2,000-year-old recipe that we're going to be learning just a little bit. Live from Market Square in downtown San Antonio, this is SA Live. Break fever in full swing here at Historic Market Square. I'm Fiona Gorstiza. And I'm David Other filling in for Mike Osterhage. Well, you might not put a ton of thought into, you know, the text message that you send. <laughs> you know, maybe not. All the text messages that you send. You right. know, and sometimes you try to just send them really quickly, but you would if you if they could randomly serve as your eternal legacy. That is terrifying to think about, right? Like I mean, the last thing <laughs> that you text could be on your tombstone. Right. And which, I mean, if it really was the case, it would be it'd be scary to see what people have. Now, in the latest new viral trend, some people are sharing with their friends. It's the last text that you send, okay, that would become what is on your tombstone. And it's permanent. It's your last words. And, I mean, that in itself. So what is what are your last words that would be on there? Okay, hold on. Let me look. <laughs> One second. Hold on. I got to unlock it. Okay, mine would be in a meeting, call you after. <laughs> All right, oh, okay, okay. What about you? Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's, Man, a few words. <laughs> that's it. Um, so you never know. You, gotta, you rush through these things, but then if you think about it, if it's going to be on there forever, it's terrifying. But share with, with us your last text that you sent. It would be on your tombstone now, but you can share it with us on SA Live KSET on Facebook and Twitter, and we'll share it later on in the show. I can't wait to read some of these. <laughs> okay. Well, while there's no more homework and no more books, at least for this week, while kids are on spring break, we are going to dip into a little history lesson. That's right. We are here with the Roman-style like meal that is going to be being prepared and we're actually going to be with it is Magi Madrista can you pronounce your name for me Magistra Madrista that is a very beautiful name thank you Madrista. so much for being here and you're going to be showing us all these like wonderful recipes that you have here yes I'm going to be showing you actually 2,000 year old recipes um, basically the Romans use olives as their staple food so olives is what we're going to start with and they made a um, recipe that's sort of like bruschetta Ooh. so you need chopped up black olives and chopped up green olives okay so here I'll let y'all add okay <laughs> Ready, set, go. All right, there yeah. we go. <laughs> and then, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> then they added a little olive oil to the, the mixture. They also added uh, vinegar, but I do not because we pickle our olives, and so there's already more than enough vinegar in there. But what we have to add is coriander, fennel, and cumin. Okay. Ooh. And if you'll note, this, the spices need to be ground up first. Okay. okay. So if you'll add a little bit, that's, ooh, that's... A little bit much, but that's okay. And this is actually what the this is what the Romans ate, right? This is what the Romans ate. Go ahead and start grinding there. Okay. And I can add the fennel. The fennel is already powdered. Um, the Romans used a lot of different spices, uh, but a lot of them are the same as the ones that we have today. Cumin is one of their main ones. Oh, and, interesting. Um, Yes, and it's not one you would expect. It's not one you would expect because no. the, the flavors are more like, uh, I put that in a lot of Hispanic dishes. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And in a minute, we're going to make uh, cumin and carrots. Ooh. In fact, while you're grinding mm -hmm. that, I'm going to go ahead and get him started because okay. okay. the carrots have to be cooked. Okay. Perfect. So we have to start. Okay. So what do we do? Here's the fun part. We have to, to <laughs> not set the st studio on fire. This is, that's yes. my, one, my one job when I'm here is to not set things on fire. There we there go. There we go. Okay. Okay. Now, okay. hold it there. And then there's your spatula. Okay. Again, we're going to add olive oil. Perfect. And just enough to give it a something that, that can soak into the carrots. There you go. I'm already cooking with exactly. hot oil over here. And don't give you too many. Not too many carrots. There we go. And then, of course, cumin. She's still grinding the, the spices <laughs> for this. She's so still I'm grinding. So I'm going to use the powdered I'll cumin. Grind. Yeah. I will grind until you tell me to stop. And just a little bit of cumin. That's all you need. Yes, just a little bit. And you just basically cook them until they're tender. And Wonderful. carrots with cumin give them a totally different flavor. They're very, very savory when you cook them with cumin rather than uh, it's kind of sweet when you cook them. Yeah. Oh, that meals. smells so yeah, okay. good. And now I'm grinding these because, uh, you know, obviously back then they didn't have everything that we do today to exactly. kind of, you know, all the modern conveniences and even things to preserve food. But there is a way to preserve food, right? There is. There is. Uh, we were talking about the melon earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically... 
we started our mixture for the marinade for the melon. Okay, and what do we have in there already? Um, well, we're gonna add a little bit more. We need uh, red wine vinegar. Right here? Yes. Okay, a little bit? Just a little bit. Okay. There you go. Right. And then add some more honey. Add some more The important honey. thing when you're pickling fruit uh -huh. is to add honey to it mm. because you do not want it too bitter. Okay, that's and a good then tip. Good tip. I suggest you do it in a Tupperware container. Uh huh. Make sure it is good. Uh huh. That way you can do this. Shake it up. Exactly. Okay. And then grab your honeydew. Okay. And honeydew doesn't have much flavor, and this gives it a very, very pungent flavor. Mm -hmm. And now it's going to be something that's the the most flavorful fruit in the in Shake the bowl. It up. Yes. And then you just leave it, and you can. So eat how, it long, how long? How long will this last? <laughs> um, Several weeks. Oh. Several weeks. And no icebox at all. Just and don't put it out in the sun. This is really cool. icebox. So how did they keep it cool? Uh, they used to bury things in the ground. They had huge amphora underneath the ground. Uh, this kind of amphora. Uh -huh. oh. and, and under the ground, it's cooler. Okay, so this will last for a couple <laughs> That'll last of weeks. For That's now, so neat. Did the Romans eat three meals a day? They did, actually. Um, they had a breakfast called Iron Coculum, mm -hmm. and that was eaten at dawn. They would have literally gotten up and eaten the leftovers from the night before. And then Prandium was lunch. And that would have been eaten out. The Romans actually had fast food. That's There's cool. There's places called Thermopolium, <laughs> uh -huh. and it would have had soup and sandwiches and things like that. And you could actually eat um, your lunch out, purchased, just like we do today. That's Speaking of lunch, we, we do have some of your students here. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> huh? Now, they are, they are having some of the honeydew, right? Yes, and some of the bread and with the olives. Okay. So. Now, I believe the carrots are done. So once they're done, yes, once we're going to move done, them over. Let's put them in a container. There we go. Okay, I'll let you. Okay. There we go. There we go. Oh yeah, that's perfect. Right, they just got they got right there. Look at that. There yes. we go. Okay. Awesome. And then, okay. There we go. There's right there. off the fire. And right? that that is perfect because and they're, and they're hey. just tender. They're just tender. <laughs> okay. Now, what, Andre, what is the junior classical league? For um, those who don't know, the junior classical league is a uh, we're a branch of a national organization. Um, we are basically um, we want to preserve and promote the study of Latin. And uh, at basis, actually, every student takes Latin in sixth grade. So um, that's why some of our students out there um, basically are so young. Normally, middle schoolers don't take Latin, but at our school, they do. Uh -huh. And um, we try to provide opportunities to use Latin, to use Roman culture. Um, to educate, right? right? I mean, you exactly. got to get it. You exactly. gotta, it's, so, it's such an it's important part of history. It's got to be hands-on. You've That's got right. to learn. Well, and, and if, I, if I had a history class where I was eating the whole time, I mean, <laughs> That's I would the best way to learn. I would have straight A's. <laughs> you got, it goes in your head, it goes in your stomach, stomach. and it goes yes. all over the place. Exactly. Well, Matrisa, right. thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you very thank much for having so much. Yeah, yes. And for more information on the program, you can head to essaylive.com and click on the As Seen on SA Live tab. Thank you so much, Andrea. Yes, and it, no, it's a Try It Tuesday, right? And today, we actually get to watch something very interesting with my uh, yeah, <laughs> Mike tries Taekwondo, everything from powerful punches to breaking boards, what and we'll see what he, if he has what it takes to master the art. I think he will. Mm. It's a Try It Tuesday. I've got the outfit on. I'm going to give Taekwondo a shot. Here we go, breaking a board. First take. <laughs> No? <laughs> Karate Kid? So we are here with Master Kantu and Taekwondo. This is what you usually see on TV and movies when people are fighting uh, the Karate Kid, correct? Right, yeah. Taekwondo definitely got famous for its kicking techniques. So you're going to see a lot of kicks. It's a stand-up striking martial art from South Korea. And so with all the kicks and punches, it's definitely being used in movies and TV shows for those action scenes. And this is fairly new in, in comparison to other martial arts, correct? Yeah, we practice traditional Taekwondo, so it hasn't changed um, since it came over. Um, in, in the 70s. So CDK is a taekwondo club that I have here, and CDK stands for Chunju Kwan. So there are ma many different Kwans in the Korean um, country, and they put them all together under one word, taekwondo. Who 
joins and, and learns Taekwondo? I know so you got all different ages, all different sizes. Yes, I mean, really anyone. I've had students from five years old all the way up to retirement age. Anyone can do it. We can adjust the training as necessary. But yeah, it's for all ages, for sure. Why do they do it? Is it is it exercise? Is it conditioning? Is it... You know, I've asked that question. Beat somebody up. <laughs> I've asked that question to most new students, and it's surprising they have different answers. Mm -hmm. We have parents that want their their children to learn respect and self control and have more focus in school, and we definitely work on character development here. But at the same time, right, you have we have students have have dealt with bullying and they've dealt with some violence, and they want to make sure they can protect themselves and feel safe. Well, you're a how many degree black right, belt? So I'm a fifth degree black belt um, in under the TTA, the Traditional Taekwondo Association. And as far as to get to that first rank of black belt, each about three years of training. Okay. Yeah. What all does it involve? Kicks and punches and flying leaps and everything? All right. So at first, I would say at first, the character development is a big issue. We want to make sure that students can stand at attention. We have mm -hmm. to trust that they can have courtesy in class. So that's the first part. And then the physical stuff, we use different tools. We have different forms of sparring. Um, we have, uh, of course, the forms that we practice, which is non-contact, very safe way to practice our techniques. We do have pad sparring, which you'll see at tournaments quite a bit. And then we have board breaking, which focuses on penetrating to that target. And I assume somebody coming in here, you have to kind of teach them and get them in the mindset, this is not to go out and now start picking fights. Again, this right. is the con to have the confidence <laughs> that if you're getting picked on, you exactly. back away or you can't defend yourself. Yeah, even with the younger students, we actually do some role playing. Here and work towards a smooth and orderly transition for Secretary of State designate Mike Pompeo. I'm encouraging my policy planning team and undersecretaries and assistant secretaries, those confirmed, as well as those in acting positions, to remain at their post and continue our mission at the State Department and working with the interagency process. I will be meeting uh, members of my front office team and policy planning later today to thank them for their service. Uh, they have been extraordinarily dedicated to our mission, which includes promoting values that I view as being very important. So the safety and security of our State Department personnel, accountability, which means treating each other with honesty and integrity, and respect for one another. Most recently, in particular, to address challenges of sexual harassment within the department. I want to speak now to my State Department colleagues and to our interagency colleagues and partners at DOD and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, most particularly. To my Foreign Service officers and Civil Service colleagues, we all took the same oath of office. Whether you're a career, employee, or political appointee, we are all bound by that common commitment to support and defend the Constitution, to bear true faith and allegiance to the same. It's, and at every meeting I've had throughout the year, this has been on the agenda to discuss. <clears throat> the adoption of the South Asia strategy with a conditions-based military plan as the tool to compel the Taliban to reconciliation and peace talks with the Afghan government finally equipped our military planners with a strategy which they can execute as opposed to a succession of 16 one-year strategies. This clear military commitment attracted the support of allies broadly and equipped our diplomats with a whole new level of certainty around how to prepare for the peace talks and achieve the final objectives. In other areas where progress has been made, much work remains. In Syria, we did achieve important ceasefires and stabilizations, which we know has saved thousands of lives. There's more to be done in Syria, particularly with respect to achieving the peace, as well as stabilizing Iraq and seeing a healthy government installed, and more broadly in the entire global campaign to defeat ISIS. Nothing is possible without allies and, pop and partners, though. Much work remains to establish a clear view of the nature of our future relationship with China. How shall we deal with one another over the next 50 years and ensure a period of prosperity for all of our peoples, free of conflict between two very powerful nations? And much work remains to respond to the troubling behavior and actions of the, on the part of the Russian government. Russia must assess carefully 
as to how its actions are in the best interest of the Russian people and of the world more broadly. Continuing on their current trajectory is likely to lead to greater isolation on their part, a situation which is not in anyone's interest. So to my colleagues in the State Department and the interagency, much remains to be done to achieve our mission on behalf of the American people, with allies and with partners. I close by thanking all for the privilege of serving beside you for the last 14 months. Importantly, to the 300 plus million Americans, thank you for your devotion to a free and open society, to acts of kindness towards one another, to honesty and the quiet hard work that you do every day to support this government with your tax dollars. All of us, we know, want to leave this place as a better place for the next generation. I'll now return to private life as a private citizen, as a proud American, proud of the opportunity I've had to serve my country. God bless all of you. God bless the American people. God bless America. Rex Tillerson there leaving the briefing room after saying he would be turning over all responsibilities as the Secretary of State at the end of the day to the Deputy, Deputy Secretary of State, John Sullivan. The Secretary also said there they received a call from President Trump a little after noon today to talk about the order, what he called the orderly transition. What's interesting about that, of course, is that President Trump announced the firing himself with a tweet at 844 this morning and then appeared before cameras on his way to California earlier this morning. Uh, Rex and I have been talking about this for a long time. Uh, we, we got along actually quite well, but we disagreed on things. When you look at uh, the Iran deal, I think it's terrible. I guess he it was okay. I wanted to either break it or do something, and he felt a little bit differently. So we were not really thinking the same with Mike policy team at this point, the staffing in the State Department and in the Foreign Service, and whether the, the, the administration has the team in place to prepare for this summit with North Korea. And, and, and that's the question, George, the State Department. There are so many unfilled positions. There is no ambassador to South Korea right now, although there is a very capable number two in charge there in Seoul. Uh, but the State Department and the Steve Goldstein today fired. I really haven't seen anything like the State Department so suddenly. And this is the statement that he made. He is the undersecretary or was the undersecretary of state for public diplomacy. The secretary had every intention of staying because of the critical progress made in national security. He will miss his colleagues at the Department of State to go on. The secretary did not speak to the president and is unaware of the reason he was fired. And uh, within a couple of hours, the man who put that statement out fired. Cecilia Vega, one of the things we're seeing right here right now is President Trump doing exactly what he wants to do. He wanted to meet with Kim Jong-un in North Korea. He said he was going to do it despite the advice of the experts. He wanted his guy, Mike Pompeo, the CIA director, in as director of the CIA, as State Department head. That's what he did. And he said today that he is now close 14 months into his administration to having his cabinet be exactly the makeup that he wants it to be. We know from our sources inside the White House and outside who still talk uh, to a lot of people inside the White House that President Trump has become increasingly isolated and that he is increasingly angry. And you've got to wonder whether this is a result of the emotion that the president is feeling right now. Upcoming uh, hearings now for Mike Pompeo to be Secretary of State. Also, Gina Haspel, Martha Raddatz, final note on this. Gina Haspel, career CIA officer, has now been appointed, uh, nominated to be head of the CIA, the first woman to lead the CIA. She is the first woman to lead the CIA, and within the CIA, I, I think she is very well liked. There will be many questions about her past. In 2002, she was in charge in one of one of those so-called black sites where they did enhanced interrogation and also with the destruction of the tapes from that, so she will face questions about that. Okay, there you have it. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson is out. He'll be turning over all responsibilities at the end of the day. You can get the latest breaking news anytime by downloading the ABC News app and, of course, a full report tonight on World News tonight with David Muir. Have a good day. We got Signal. All these guys have passed through uh, the Tana Music Awards and look at them now. I mean, that's, those are common household names, you know. Um, we also, uh, we, we do a lot of great things with these artists. It's just so much, um, 
it, it's awesome. That's all I can say about it. You know, <laughs> well, <laughs> like I, mean, I said, we've been around for, you know, like I said, we've been around since uh, 1980. Mm -hmm. It's a nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a great staff that's right behind us. And this is every year that we've done this. We've been here for two decades already here at just Market Square alone. And, uh, of course, you know, we are, um, we're just so happy to get another year under our belt, and we're ready to get this started. What are we looking at right here? The proclamation from the uh, mayor of San Antonio. Oh, my gosh, it's official. <laughs> I mean, it is and, official. I mean, and this event is so important to Tejano music. It really is. You know? It really is. Like I said, it showcases all of our up-and-coming artists, uh, of course, with our established artists. And, uh, like I said, we feature, you know, from, from young, I mean, we've got... Um, I want to say a 14-year-old accordion player, uh, Christina, she's awesome. She's going to be out here performing, and of course, to our established artists, like I said, too. So, like I said, we we bring a variety of music that nobody else does. Right. Okay. So come on out. Have a good time with 90,000 of your closest friends. Well, right? just last year, we had over 100,000 people just on Saturday alone. Oh, my yes, God. Yes, 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 yes. So well, there's the information on the screen, March 15th to 18th here at Historic Market Square, the Tejano Music Awards Fanfare 2018. For more information, just head to TejanoMusicAwards.com. All right, next on SA Live, celebrating San Antonio families at the Museum. We're going to give you the inside scoop on San Antonio's family-friendly options straight from the parents and kids themselves. And still ahead, how to drop your energy bill, but also how not to be left in the dark when the power goes out. We're going to tell you about an option you have coming up. And we're back on this terrific Tuesday as spring break continues right here at Market Square on SA Live. And we're continuing the countdown to San Antonio's 300th birthday this year. That's right. We sent out our Jen Tobias Dreski out to the museum to see what families think and what they think about the Alamo City and why they love it. out here exploring at the museum. That's one of the many favorite places here in San Antonio. So we're gonna go around and ask people, what else do they love about San Antonio? Let's go check it out. What do you love about San Antonio? Uh, we enjoy the Pearl. Oh, baby, it's okay. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, children's activities. I know San Antonio looks like they've done a lot to the infrastructure to help families come out and be more active. I like San Antonio because I love the food there. It's your favorite. cheese taco. I knew you were going to say that. That was my favorite, too, at your age. Um, I like the exciting things that I get to see. Like what? What's your favorite? Uh, this is a museum here. You're from San Antonio. Tell me, what do you love about this awesome city? Definitely number one thing, San Antonio Spurs. Absolutely. I think one of the first pictures of me, I'm in a San Antonio Spurs t-shirt. So, <laughs> go Spurs, go! It's an international city. You can have all kinds of fun food and meet all kinds of interesting people. And there's so much to do. And the Alamo's here. Yes. If you come to if you come to San Antonio and see the Alamo, it makes you an official Texan. I guess everybody knows that, right? I, I like San Antonio. <laughs> what do you love about San Antonio? Uh, just the culture and the people and all the the history here. I love San Antonio. We moved here from Corpus Christi, Texas, and every time we get right on the outskirts of San Antonio, we just praise the Lord that he moved us here. It's a beautiful city, and we love the hill country. We live in the yes. hill country, and it's just gorgeous right out there in Pot Creek, Texas. <laughs> All right, next on SA Live, calling all cowboys and cowgirls. We'll take you to a spring break camp that's getting kids of all ages rodeo ready. But first, you know, we do a TV show every day here at Market Square. And, you know, if our power were to go out, whew, well, that would not be good, right? And some folks out there, well, they can't afford to be left. Maybe they've got medical issues, elderly parents, children. You want to make sure you always have power. And now there is an option for you. And joining me today is 
Rodriguez with, with uh, South Texas Solar. Before we explain what solar power is and this battery backup, this happened to you, right? It did, yes. A few weeks ago, I had a, a three-hour-long power outage. Oh, no. A one-year-old woke up because her lullaby and white noise uh, was eliminated. That then woke up my four-year-old son. Uh, mama was awake throughout the entire night, which meant grumpy mama at night, yep. grumpy mama in the morning. Uh -huh. And so it was just a really bad, bad situation. Oh, yeah, because the mama ain't happy. Nobody's happy. Nobody's happy. <laughs> yeah, we learned that lesson a long time ago. <laughs> okay, so before we explain the battery backup, tell folks uh, how they can you know, really invest and save money with solar power. Sure, absolutely. So CPS has been running the solar rebate program since 2009. And several, several thousands of our San Antonio citizens have taken advantage of it to drive down the upfront cost of solar. Uh, we can now get it today to where with a financing package in place, we can actually make your solar system cost less than what it's saving you on your electric bill. So with no upfront cost, no installation cost, no meeting fees or anything like that, you're immediately saving money on your overall financial uh, budget, and you're able to reinvest those funds back into your family, back into home improvements, college tuition, things like that. Exactly. Uh, you know, summer family vacations, whatever the kids may need along the way. This is putting that's putting money back in your pocket right. when you think of this as that investment. And we saw the picture of that you know energy bill where it was you know less than twenty bucks, so it's barely anything at all. Now, so if you harness that solar power you can get a battery backup and that helps. Tell folks how. Exactly, so just like you mentioned earlier, there's several people in the market today that are dependent on always having energy available to them, whether it be uh, rural area folks that are dependent on a well to keep their water running or doctors who need to keep certain medications at a certain temperature or fathers who have to keep baby asleep or else mama gets very angry. Right? So there are several instances where this can be uh, very advantageous to you. When the grid does go down, if you do not have a battery backup system, whether you have solar or not, right. you lose electricity. This is the uh, resolution to that. So if the grid goes down, your battery backup kicks in, you're able to keep a room or two up and running and able to keep having energy in those sections of your home until the grid's able to come back up and then you switch back over to grid power. So can folks buy a battery backup from South Texas Solar? Absolutely. So the LG Chem battery portfolio is so diverse in size and as well as the compatibility that it has with different inverters. So whether you got a system from us or not, we can without a doubt get you a battery backup system and then you're covered. You have that, that nice security blanket wrapped around you in case something happens in the middle of the night. Great stuff. Thank you so much from Ben Rodriguez with South Texas Solar. For more information on South Texas Solar and their services, just head to TXSolarSystems.com or call 405-8628. That's 405-8628 for more. We'll be right back. Well, some pint-sized pro rodeo hopefuls are putting their best boots forward at a local spring break camp. Oh, we stopped by the rodeo camp at Hidden Springs Youth Ranch to see how kids are learning skills from PRCA athletes and getting wrangled in on a good time. Scotty Neesmith, PRCA bareback rider, yeah. right? So that's your background and a little bit of roping as well, yeah. right? Um, tell me about how great this camp is that these kids have this to kind of prep them for being possibly a professional rodeo athlete. I was lucky when I grew up. Uh, my dad rodeoed, put on rodeos for a living, so I grew up around rodeo and people helped me. And a lot of people don't have that. I think the sport of rodeo will be a lot more popular with things like this because people, kids get to get out and they can see how fun it is. Roping a dummy, riding a barrel, you know, doing steer wrestling, doing all that stuff. They get to see it. I was around it the whole time. That's why it helped me get into it. Stuff like this is great to help kids just know what the sport is. I'm here with Gary Case, who is a pro rodeo judge and former what kind of rider? Rough stock rider. Rough stock rider. Uh, road bull, saddle bronc, and bareback horses. Okay, so this rodeo camp really helps kids that have that interest to possibly go professional in the rodeo sport to really get them started on the right foot, well, so to speak, right? It, it does that, but it, it goes a step further. A lot of these kids have never been exposed to rodeo and so this is an introductory camp to kids that might not be in an agricultural based area so we we've had a good mixture of kids that are already rodeo savvy and some that show a lot of potential and interest it's pretty exciting 
Well, I like horses a lot. I like to ride bucking horses, so I think it, that saddle bronc riding was really fun. Yeah, I did practice bull riding and steer wrestling. I did roping. Start with your feet back. You're going to spur it out for two jumps. It's, it's awesome to have a kid that's never touched a rope. I'm teaching the roping here this week. And never touched a rope before, and I ask him all first, who's roped, who's roped? And I have a kid never touched a rope, and he grabs it, and the first time, he's kind of walling it around, and then like two times later, he's swinging it right, everything's perfect, and he ropes it, and his, his face just lights up. Like, I got it! And he goes to holler and having an awesome time. It's great. Is this you guys' first time at rodeo camp? Yes! yes. What do you guys think about it? I it was, think it was really fun. Uh -huh. Yeah. I had fun. I learned something new. What have you tried here at rodeo camp? Bull riding. Oh. Yeah. And what did you learn about that? Bull riding can be dangerous, but it's also really fun. What do you guys want to be when you grow up? I want to be a steer wrestler. Uh-huh. I want to try to do the barrel. Barrel like. racing? Oh, uh, yeah! So is this kind of cool to have this type of rodeo camp here where you guys can actually practice safely? Yes. Learning, learning skills? I think yeah. it's awesome and fun and, at the same time. And it gives us more, like, more challenges in our life if we want to do something that, because girls can do anything that boys are doing right now. And even if boys go on a bull, girls can also go on a bull, right? That's right, yes they can. Well, Hidden Springs Youth Ranch Rodeo Camp is going on this week through Friday, March 16th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. It's located about 30 minutes from downtown San Antonio in Converse. For more information, just head to our website, salive.com, and click on the As Seen on SA Live tab. All right, tomorrow on SA Live, we're rerunning one of our favorite shows. Mike takes a dive into the deep and with a baby beluga. It's really adorable. And we're going to go to Santico's for the, I don't know, you guys, the Casablanca Theater is fantastic. All that tomorrow on SA Live. Plus, who doesn't like a tall, cold margarita? Yes, we're going to be sharing some sip-worthy Tex-Mex cocktail recipes all tomorrow at 1. But first, it is an important topic that really covers everybody here in the United States. It's one in every 18 Americans has colon cancer or is affected by it. And today is joining with me is Dr. Jan Prezak. And now, doctor, you're gonna be talking to us today about colon cancer awareness. Now, why is it so important to be proactive about colon cancer? Well, David, uh, March is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. So we're really trying to get the message out there for people to get screened. Col uh, colon cancer is the third uh, most prevalent cancer, the highest in mortality after lung and breast in women and lung and prostate in, in men. Wow. Uh, but it's one of the more preventable cancers. So uh, people should start thinking about getting a colonoscopy, which is a simple test with a camera to check their entire colon or large intestine to find colon uh, polyps. Colon polyps are little tiny clumps of cells that can grow slowly and some of them can turn into cancer. So we're trying to catch these little polyps early mm -hmm. and that way we prevent cancer from forming. And that's one of the symptoms that you're looking for. So that's, um, and of course there's a lot of other symptoms, but talk to me right. a little bit about that. What are some of the right. other symptoms? Well, polyps don't usually give any symptoms, uh, but if people who have uh, symptoms of colorectal cancer may include uh, a change in your bowel habit, if you, if you notice a change in, in, in your usual bowel habits, that may be a reason to see your doctor. Uh, many people do not experience any symptoms whatsoever, so that's why it's important to get your test done at a timely fashion at age 50 uh, for most people, but some uh, people may need to start sooner. Patients who have a family history of colon cancer, for instance, should start earlier. Uh, patient, uh, patients from our African-American descent uh, there is data to show that they are, have a higher risk of colon cancer, so they should start at age 45. Um, and speaking of risks, uh, what are some of the risk factors of colon cancer? Uh, uh, basically, uh, diabetes, uh, obesity, smoking, alcohol, uh, having a, fi a family history of colon cancer, a diet that is low in fiber, uh, high in fat, can lead to uh, formation of colon cancer. So really, we've got to watch what you eat, right? Because that can help pe perpetuate any of the Absolutely. symptoms that you have. Now, how is it diagnosed? Like, what, are, what is Baptist Health Systems doing to help and diagnose colon cancer? 
Well, uh, the, main, the main test, the most efficacious test for uh, detection of uh, colon polyps and colon cancer is the colonoscopy. It's a test that we use with a, a fiber optic camera uh, that we insert and go all around the colon and look for these little clumps of cells called polyps. And if we find them, we can actually remove them. And in that way, we prevent cancer from forming. And that's how, I mean, this is a, a good way then to, for people to prevent colon to prevent, cancer. So yes. all the different signs there, you can see up on your screen, really help you prevent any kind of signs right. of that. And, and, and the colonoscopy, many people are fearful to have a colonoscopy done. They may have heard uh, many different uh, opinions. Uh, but for the most part, colonoscopy is a very safe procedure. Uh, nowadays, we have excellent uh, medications to help you prepare for it. Uh, it is not as bad as what we used to have uh, many years ago. Uh, and the procedure itself is painless. Uh, you're under anesthesia. It's about a 10 to 15 minute procedure. Mm -hmm. You're unaware of it. And then after the procedure, you wake up and go home. And that's fantastic. So I mean, because it's not, it's not the normal uncomfortableness that, you're, that people are accustomed to with the procedure. Yes. Dr. Prezak, thank you so much for coming thank on Thank you very show. much. And for more information on screenings, treatment, diagnosis, or prevention of colorectal cancer, just go to baptisthealthsystem.com. We'll be right back. Well, thank you so much for watching today's show. Enjoy the rest of your spring break because tomorrow yeah. we are rerunning one of our favorite shows. That's right. Enjoy your spring break. Man, I know I am. I'm excited. <laughs> Have a good one, y'all.